All right. The sermon title this morning is Leadership in the Local Church. Leadership in the Local Church. So just some fundamental doctrine today, uh, teaching you about church and specifically about leadership in the church. So what I'm going to cover today, I'll give you a, uh, a rundown on you know, why we are an independent church, you know, why we're not part of a denomination, and what I believe about church leadership. So we read in Titus 1, over there a bit of the qualifications of a bishop and we see in first timothy 3 as well that the deacon also has uh, similar qualifications and this is more about the character so we'll talk about why you know these these characteristics and also why church leadership should be men and not women and lastly why our church is not a democratic church and i'll explain that later that leadership is appointed from top down we don't vote here we don't vote in leadership it's, it's not a democracy in australia we have democracy but church is not meant to be a democracy. Church is meant to be appointed leadership. Okay, so uh, let's get into the service. My first point is God-ordained authority. God-ordained authority. Now, when the Bible talks about God ordaining the powers that be, we're talking about a structure that he's ordained. We're not talking about everybody that is in power is necess necessarily put there by God. I mean, you think about our nation. You know, our nation has an authority structure and God wants nations to have an authority structure. But, does that do, but that does not mean everyone in power is put there by God. You know, sometimes people are put there in power by Satan. Sometimes it's just the love of money and whatnot that pe puts people in power. But what, we, what we're talking about when we talk about God-ordained authority is that authority exists, the structure exists. And even though we may not agree with the authority or maybe put there by you know the wrong forces you know we are as much as possible as much as lies in lieth in us to live peaceably with all men and to obey every ordinance of man as long as it does not contradict god's word why because we don't just submit blindly to governments we don't just submit blindly to authority we submit to the higher power and the higher power highest power is god's word the holy bible so when you think about some christians unfortunately just blindly teach that you know christians are just meant to obey the government obey whatever they do right but it's not first of all governments sometimes like in our instance sometimes governments go against the law of the land itself so we have the constitution in our country so sometimes governments will create laws that go against the constitution so what's the higher power you can obey the constitution so people getting in trouble for obeying the constitution by disobeying some law a politician has passed are not actually disobeying god because they are submitting to the higher power but what happens if a constitution has a law that forbids obeying god well then you obey god rather than men right so even if we did not have the freedom to practice our religion in this country protected by the constitution we ought to still do it right because god commands us so you can see that there is an authority structure there that god has put in place that we are to respect now in the church it's no different the church has authority structure church is not a free-for-all right this is why churches should not be democratic there should be an authority structure where there are people in charge first corinthians 12 look now ye are the body of christ and members in particular and god has set some in the church so note that the the church is likened to a body and we'll talk about that a bit later when we think about hey why is the church independent right why is why, why do we believe in independent churches rather than denominational type churches and god hath set some in the church first apostles secondarily prophets thirdly teachers so we see here that god is appointing these things in the very beginning right because apostles prophets and then from there on you have the ordination of pastors and teachers and evangelists thirdly teachers after that miracles and gifts of healing helps governments diversities of tongues now this sermon is not about gifts of the holy spirit but my, my personal you know my position on gifts of the spirit is that they have ceased i think that's something that was passed on by the apostles and it's no longer something for us now but here is a time when they still did exist right when the apostles and prophets were still around and he's mentioning here that there are all these different things these talents and abilities and gifts in the church and they all come together as a body which is in first corinthians 12. but what i'm mainly pointing out here in first corinthians 12 verse 28 is you see how gov governments is is is, is uh, set in the church so we have this structure of leadership within god's organization and it's similar to if you think about it 
you know, church is no different to like a family. So a family has structure where you have the man in charge and then you have the wife and then you have the children, right? So a family is not democratic either. You know, you don't have, you don't think like, okay, what are we going to eat for dinner? What are we going to eat for lunch? Well, let's, let's let the children vote. The children are going to outvote the parents every time, right? We're going to have ice cream for breakfast, you know, gummies for lunch and then what? Chocolate for dinner, you know? You want to eat your veggies? No. You want to eat salad? No. You know, so you can't have that in the family. So it's the same in the church. You have structure in the family, you have structure in church, and one of these is government. Now, why are we an independent church? Right? We're independent. What's the difference between being an independent church and being a denominational church? Well, see, the way denominations work is that there is a head in a church somewhere, and all the churches sort of submit to that head church as opposed to every individual church submitting directly to God. Now, what's the problem with denominations? The problem with denominations is if sometimes if one church goes bad, they all go bad, right? Because they're all under control of this one head. So you may have local bodies all over the place, but when they're all connected under one banner, a bit like the Catholic church, if the Pope, Pope goes bad, then they all go bad because they all just blindly follow. Whereas how should churches be? Churches independently, like this body here, ought to answer to Jesus Christ. We should do, strive as a body here to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And like the church is a body, and the body answers to the head, we as a church ought to answer directly to Jesus Christ through our leadership, so independent meaning we're self-governed, as opposed to we are governed by another church somewhere else. Ephesians 5, look here, we see here in the family. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. So you see here that the marriage relationship is likened to how a church should submit to Jesus Christ. And, you know, if you think about, say, the marriage relationship, how should a church submit to Jesus Christ? Well, it should submit to Jesus Christ in every area according to the will of God. So when you think about how should a wife submit to her husband in the same way. So it's, you know, that's a, not a popular teaching these days, but this is what the Bible says. And if we want a good marriage, you know, you wonder why, you know, how many, like, is it three out of, is it like 75% divorce rate, people say, like, or is it one out of four? I can't remember which way it is. It's either one out of four or it's three out of four, I remember. How many people are getting divorced these days? You know, my parents are divorced. You probably know a multitude of people that are divorced. When you hear about people that are married for 10, 20, 50 years, people are like, wow, good work. How did you do it? Well, likely, you know, they probably had, you know, one submit to the other, you know, where, you know, you have some peace in the family. But what we're talking about here is ch church leadership. So we see here that Christ should be the head of this body. Now, some people have this idea of a universal church, right? And we'll talk about the problems of that later. And they'll say like, ah, oh, you see how Christ is head of the church. There's one church and they say, oh, you know, that's why you have a pope or you have a, uh, what do they call it in the Orthodox church? They call it like a board or something. I can't remember what they call it. Um, presbytery. Uh, and they say, oh, look, it's the church. But you've got to think here. Well, here it says the husband is head of the wife. Is there only one husband in the world? Is there only one wife in the world? No, it's talking about Christ is the head of every husband and, and you know, and the wife, every wife submits to her husband, just like Christ is the head of every church. So there isn't a universal church. There's a universal body, right? So once we believe on Jesus Christ, we're all part of the body of Jesus Christ. But church specifically refers to a gathering. So we're not physically gathered, even though we may be spiritually part of this one body, the church can be called the body of Christ because we are you know, part of the body of Christ. So like a church operates like a body, but not every church is part of the one church. Now one day when we're all gathered in heaven, there will be one church. But now, that's why in the Bible you see churches, the church in Asia, the church in Galatia, the church in Liverpool. Right? So we have independent churches and churches ought to answer to Jesus Christ. Now does that mean churches can't work together? Of course, they can work together, they can form partnerships, they can do things that are mutually beneficial. But what we're talking about is authority. Right? One church should not submit to the authority of another church. Every church, through its own leadership, should submit to the Lord Jesus Christ directly. And it gives them the freedom and the liberty in Christ to be able to follow the Word of God as they see fit for the people in their congregation. 
We see here in Colossians 1 the same passage. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So just like Christ is the head of the family, he is the head of the church. 1 Corinthians 11, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Okay, so the family is a similar concept to the church. And like I said, because there is an authority structure in the church, this is one reason why you ought to be opposed to a universal church. Because see, if there is only one church, then if there's an authority structure within the church, then who's in charge of this one church? You know, this is where the Catholics get this universal church idea, and then the Pope is the head of all these churches, right? But you have authority within the church, you have independent churches, so we have authority within this church. And that way, if one church goes bad, it won't take the others with it. Now, in Ephesians 4, we read here, we see why God gives the church pastors and teachers, or give gifts, gives gifts to men, right, and talents to men, so that they can be a blessing to the church. And we see what the point is here in Ephesians 4. He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers, right? So these are different things, these different roles that people play, evangelists, pastors and teachers. And you'll notice here that the bishop of a church or the deacon of a church can perform like some of these, right? They teach, they do the work of the evangelist, and they may lead people, they may shepherd people, right? So these roles are different to the offices that we're going to talk about later, the positions within a church. But these are some of the roles that people can take on within a church. So you may not be a bishop or a deacon, but you may teach some people in the church. I mean, Christine today, you know, is running kids club she is teaching there you know with people that go out soul winning they're doing the work of an evangelist but they may not be in a official position within the church a bishop or a deacon and it's the same you may have people that you are leading and guiding and are mentoring and have influence over and are trying to encourage in the right direction you are performing the role of a pastor in that area but that doesn't mean that you're a bishop or a deacon you know you don't hold that official position within the church now, why does God give pastors, teachers, evangelists, these, these people to the church? Look in verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And it's interesting that it's mentioned in this order because it tends to work like this in your spiritual life as well. What's the perfecting of the saints? You know, we're trying to become perfect. What? You're removing imperfections, aren't you? So you think of perfecting of the, of the saints is trying to get the sin out of your life trying to live a clean life, trying to live more holy. For the work of the ministry, right? What's the work of the ministry? The work of the ministry is evangelism, right? It's the Great Commission. Teaching the Bible, helping people to grow, making disciples, making more fishes of men, and that cycle continues. And generally, when people have unconfessed sin or sins that they are, you know, it shouldn't stop them from trying to serve because sometimes serving helps you get rid of these sins. But often, more often than not, People having sins in their life stops them from serving, right? Because they feel guilty, they feel unworthy. You know, I think these two should work hand in hand. But I think it's interesting, the order here, that generally people start to clean up their life. And when they do, they start, you know, getting involved into ministry and getting into, involved into evangelism as well. For the edifying of the body of Christ. So you've got getting rid of your sins, doing the work, evangelism, and then what's edifying of the body of Christ is not only the physical, right? Because when we try and get people into church, we are building up the body of Christ. Edifying means to build up. But edifying of the body of Christ is teaching and admonishing one another and helping one another to grow in our character. So that's what we have here. Removing of sin, work, and growing in grace and in knowledge and helping others as well grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So we have God-ordained authority. We know why it's there. Church is not a free-for-all, right? And some churches, like the Brethren Church, they try this. They try like, you know, church is just everyone just comes together, 
we're all equal here, we're all going to have our own, so just this free-for-all. We don't know who's going to speak because nobody's in charge. You know, you go to, if you have ever been to churches like those, or you know how they operate, ultimately, they have somebody in charge. You know, they, they can say all they want, that, oh, you know, we're all equal here, nobody's in charge, but you, you get there, somebody's going to say, hey, this is how it works, this is what we're going to do. Somebody, if somebody comes into the church that teaches something they don't agree with, who's going to say, sorry, you're not going to preach here, or you're not welcome here, or whatnot. It ultimately is going to happen. So people can say all they want that they don't want authority in a church, but you, you, you know as well as I, people that just think this through reasonably and logically, when you get a whole bunch of people together, if there's no authority, it's a mess. And if you don't want it to be a mess, somebody's got to step up and take charge. And then the question is, who is it? How is it determined? Well, this is what we're going to talk about today, right? how it should be done. Right? It should not be voted in and whatnot. Because it's funny, even when churches, I remember having this conversation with somebody and somebody thought, oh, you know, you should have a vote and everything like that. And, but even churches that have votes, they don't just let anybody vote. I mean, have you noticed that? Like churches that have elections and churches that vote, I mean, uh, it's just, it's just a visitor, you know, just happens to come on AGM day where they're having a vote. It's like, oh, you know him and their 20 friends, they're going to vote. It's like, no. So there's still a vetting process of who gets to take part and have that right to vote in that. So who makes that decision? Right? Somebody's going to make it. So there's always authority there, even if, you know, they try and run it democratically. But this is not the way God has it, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. Now, number two is there are two offices in the local church, two positions, and you, would, you can think of these as like two paid positions, right, within the, the local church, even though you have, you have uh, workers as well. So you can have paid positions where people are workers in the church, and I think that's how, you would, that's how I would interpret like the widows in 1 Timothy 5, where people take on widows. You may have staff and things like that. So the workers can be, I think, men and women. But when we talk about management, we're talking about leadership in the church, the managers, if you think about a business, like the managers, the CEO in a church should be men. Now, two officers, let's look at them. The first one, well, we see it here in 1 Timothy 3, the mention of the two officers, and then we'll go into each of them a bit more depth. 1 Timothy 3, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. So that's the first office we see, office of a bishop. Second one, we see further down the chapter, 1 Timothy 3, and let these also first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. And in verse 13 as well, we see the mention of the office of a deacon. For they that have used the office of a deacon well, purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith. And like I said, just because there's only two officers, that doesn't mean you can't have paid workers. Obviously, there's volunteers as well. But we're talking about leadership. Leadership positions are bishop and deacon. And, and we see here later on when we look into it, these are men, not women. Philippians 1, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. So we see two officers within the local church. Now, a few thoughts on the qualifications of a bishop. Now, we read through Titus this morning. We'll just start from verse 6 and we'll read through. And I'll give you some thoughts on this passage to give you an idea, some, some important points about church leadership. So verse 6, If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children not accused of riot or unruly. So first of all, his family is mentioned. For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God. Now, this doesn't mean perfect, because there's nobody that's perfect, right? Blameless is just talking about having a good you know, rapport amongst people and uh, you know, not being known as somebody that is corrupt and whatnot. So it gives some examples. And these, are, these qualifications that exist, this is a guide for those in authority to decide how to appoint another bishop. This, is not for you. this, you, this can be used for you to decide whether or not to follow a bishop or a deacon, right? Whether to submit to a bishop. But it's not like if you don't think somebody qualifies according to this guideline that they're no longer a bishop, right? This is about qualifications and requirements for somebody who is ordaining somebody, right? So think of it like in a business. You may have a job description and some, somebody in authority is deciding somebody's going to take that position. 
Now, if you don't think that person's qualified for that position, that doesn't mean you get to decide whether that person's in that position or not, unless you are the person in authority, right? So you just need to understand how this works, because I always see people talking about, oh, this person did this and such and such, this bishop did such and such, and it's like, oh, you know, they're no longer a bishop, they're disqualified. That's not how it works, right? If you don't believe they fulfill these qualifications, then you don't get behind them. But the way these qualifications work is, is it's a guide and a rule for an existing bishop to decide, hey, this is what God has told me to look for in a person when deciding whether to ordain them into the ministry, to ordain them a bishop. For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. Not spending too much time on what these all mean, but I'm just reading through them. Holding fast the faithful word as he had been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Now, a couple of things I just want to point out about the qualifications of the bishop and deacon, besides what I've already mentioned, is one is you'll notice here, often people think the most important thing in Christianity, and see, this is, this is a standard that everyone should strive for. This is not just something that church leaders should strive for. This is something that everybody should strive for. But if they meet these qualifications, then they can be qualified to be ordained into the ministry. But notice here, when it talks about the qualifications of the bishop, it mentions his family first and then his character. And then lastly, it talks about, and this is similar in 1 Timothy 3, I'm not going there today. Lastly, it talks about his doctrine. Now, oftentimes in fundamental churches, and this is, not, this is a mainly an issue in fundamental conservative type churches, is there is so much emphasis, and sometimes, you know, rightly so, there's an emphasis on doctrine. Right, that people think, if I have all the right doctrines, that's what qualifies me to lead a church and to pastor. And then sometimes you get these really you know, immature people taking up the office of a bishop just because they know a lot of knowledge. But knowledge is not the only thing that's important. You can know a lot of doctrine. You can be right on a lot of doctrine, but character and love, when you see the steps in the spiritual life, are, is a lot more difficult than just knowing your Bible. And that's something that I've definitely learned just experiencing pastoring this church in the last five years is, you know, when I started this church, you know, I'm like, oh, I just got to make sure I have all my doctrine lined up and everything like that. And rightly so. But as I ministered to the people in this church and been a bishop, I found that it's, it's more important to be these other things, right? These other things are more important, but you also are involved in the spiritual fight as well. So notice that. Notice that in the qualifications, this is what is mentioned first. I mean, first and foremost is his family, his wife and his children. That is the true proving grounds of whether somebody is living a spiritual life. And then here, you've got their character and their example, right? And then lastly, it's their doctrine. I'm not saying this, that doctrine is not important. I'm just trying to say, hey, in the grand scheme of things, character is definitely love, right? Trump's knowledge, as we read in 1 Corinthians 13. Character mentioned before doctrine. Family is a test of character and leadership. Uh, we know that the doctrine must be based on the Word of God, so it's not just traditions that have been passed down. We want somebody that knows the Word of God, bases what they believe on the Word of God. And lastly, uh, well, we don't see it in here, but, oh, sorry, we do. In verse 6, the husband of one wife, right? Not the wife of one husband. Now, some people will say, ah, oh, you know, like Victor, you know, he's so outdated. You know, you've got to get with the times. The times have changed. Different back then. Different back then. It's more patriarchal. That's why the Bible has a husband of one wife and leaders are men. But don't you know, nowadays, it's progressive. And, you know, women can be just as good a leader as men and whatnot. So God has it this way for a reason. And we'll talk about that. But just from a doctrinal standpoint, like when people say, oh, well, it's just what happened back then. Well, then what other qualification are we going to take out? Because you'll say, like, well, it's the husband and one wife. If that one's journey applicable back then, but not applicable today, I mean, is having faithful children not accused of a riot or unruly? Is that only applicable back then? So today, I mean, everyone's kids are out of control. I mean, can you expect a bishop to have his children in control? You know, to, you know today it's different. You know, they've got the iPad, they've got the Netflix and everything like that. You know, maybe you've got to control what they watch on Netflix. Maybe you've got to control, you know, what they play on the iPad. Maybe you've got to discipline them so they're not right or unruly. But, you know, that's, my point is, it's not just something that's back then and, and not today. 
Just like, you know, not being self-willed is back then. It's like, it's okay to be not angry. It's, it, you have to be not angry back then, but you can be soon angry now, you know, and, and, and likewise. But you get my point. You know, we, if we're going to take one out, why is it only that one? Is it because the left doesn't like that one? Is it because the, the progressives don't like that one today? But, you know, this is what we see. When we, when we look at the qualifications of the bishop, everyone's like, great, 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 great. Ah, it's not only men, not women. All of a sudden, you know, they, they're up in arms. But this is what the Bible says. And I'll explain why. There's a, there's a few good reasons that God has men rather than women. And verse uh, number three, this is what I'm going to talk about. Church leaders are not women. Church leaders should be men. Now, we read in Genesis 2, verse 18. First reason is, there's basically... One, one thing is that God has basically ordained it that way. And then I'll explain why, three reasons why God has ordained it that way. So the first point is, in Genesis 2, this is just how God has ordained it. Genesis 2, 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. So in the very beginning, when God created man, he created woman to be a follower and a helper to the man. So in the very beginning, this is just how God has ordained it. Genesis 3.16. So Genesis 3.16, not as popular as John 3.16. Right? John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But Genesis 3.16 says, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So we see here that there is an authority structure within the home. It's similar in the church as well. We already mentioned this home one, but in Ephesians 5 we see this principle in Genesis 3.16 carries over. It's something that God has intended for mankind into the New Testament. Ephesians 5, verse 22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their husbands in everything. So we could say, we could just stop at that and just say, look, God has just ordained it that way. That's the way it is. You know, the Bible says it. That settles it. But... You know, God is gracious. He gives us some reasons why this is the case as well. And I'll explain to you those reasons in the Bible today. First, look at 1 Timothy 2, verse 11. It says here, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So we'll talk a bit about, you know, what this is talking about, learning in silence and whatnot a bit later. I'll explain that to you. But what we see here is the teaching in the church is not done by women. It should be done by men. Now, why, why is that? Is it that, you know, because God just has a problem with women? No. It's because we see here from the very beginning that women have a tendency or are more easily deceived than men. And you can imagine that because, you know, you know that women just naturally are more emotional, more swayed by the emotions, more easily, uh, you know, uh, what's the word? Like um, influenced, right? And this is why it's giving this example here. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. So there's the God just ordaining the man in charge and the woman as a follower. But verse 14, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. I mean, that's just been my personal experience as well. Like when I talk to Christians, men and women, sometimes I'm trying to explain like Bible doctrine, trying to explain salvation. And more often than not, like what I find in my own life, you know, men can think through things logically. They can understand the argument. But, you know, women, especially in the Pentecostal movement, like if, or in, even as a Mormon, you know, if a, if a woman has had an emotional experience or they've had some spiritual experience, it's very hard for them to just get off that, even if though that, that spiritual experience is leading them in the wrong direction, leading them away from God's Word. Now, in the Bible, the, the apostles had a spiritual experience. They saw Jesus transfigured on the mount. But you remember what they said in Second Peter? They said, hey, we have a more sure word of prophecy. It was more important to them what the Bible said, even to what they saw with their own eyes. 
So you never want to put any experience above the Word of God. Experiences, visions, whatever, anything supernatural needs to align with the Word of God. And this is why it's important that men teach, because men tend to think more methodically, logically, not as easily deceived, whereas women are more easily. And this is why men are in charge. Now, in Ephesians 5, we read about the wives. Here's the husbands. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So we have God just ordaining men in charge. We have women being more easily deceived. This is why men are in charge. Men are appointed to, to lead. But also men have a responsibility to protect right, their followers, protect their family. So if you have the responsibility and the accountability to protect your family, you need the authority to make decisions for that family. So this is another reason why men are in charge, because God does not hold the women accountable for protecting the family. They, they hold, he holds the men accountable. But if the women are in charge and the women do, and the, the wife does something that puts the family at risk, how can God hold the husband accountable? Right? So this is why the husband is held accountable. He is in charge. He leads. Right? Hebrews 13, verse 17. Obey them that have the rule over you. So this is a principle, not just in church, right, but also you know, to, to family as well, when it comes to children obeying their parents, wives submitting to their husbands. Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. So notice here it mentions the fact that they must give an account, this is why they're in charge. And you know what? If you submit yourselves to that authority, then those that are leading will lead with joy and not with grief, right? So submitting, you've got to think about, just like in church, it's the same. Like if people do what I ask, do things according to this church, then I will lead with joy and not with grief. And you know what? That's going to be more profitable for you. <laughs> but it's the same in your family as well. Right, and your family as well, hey, if wives, children submit to their parents, you know what? Your parents are going to be more profitable to you, children. And if you submit to your husband, then your husband will likely be more profitable to you as well. Now let's talk a bit about this, uh, you know, women keep silence in the churches. Let your women learn in silence. All right? So in 1 Corinthians 4, how does this work? How do you, under how do you understand this? It says here in 1 Corinthians 14, 34, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the Lord. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Now you may read this in your own time, and read this yourself, and just think, whoa, uh, as a woman, am I meant to just, as soon as I enter these doors, zip it, <laughs> you know what I mean, and not say anything? So let me explain to you how this works and what God intends uh, with this passage as I understand it. Now, first of all, a church is not a building, okay? So it's not a, if you're in a certain premise that you're not allowed to talk, right? So it's when it says, let your women keep silence in the churches, it's not permitted unto them to, for them to speak. It's not talking about a location, right? So, so in this building, it's not that you're just not allowed to say anything. It's not even saying that you're not allowed to say anything while we're gathered here. Because you might say, Victor, does that mean I can't speak before? I can't speak after? You know, the church is gathered here. Like, when am I allowed to speak as a woman? No, no. So the context here is, and if you read, you can read the rest of 1 Corinthians 14. But the, 1 Corinthians 14, we're, we're not going to read it for sake of time. But it's talking about, you know, people taking turns teaching. Right? So this is what you're sitting under now. So you notice here, when it says women keep silence in the churches, the parallel passage in 1 Timothy it says, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. Right? I suffer not a woman to teach. So if you put this in the context of 1 Corinthians 14, what is this talking about? Is this saying women can't sing? Is this that women can't you know, say anything? Uh, they, they can't uh, you know, talk afterwards while we're eating and whatnot? No, what it's saying here is that men are appointed to preach. Right? Men lead. Men teach the church, like you're sitting in here now. Like what you're experiencing right now, the church is gathered, it's at attention. Only men should address the congregation. Right? So this is when it's saying it's not permitted to them to speak. It's saying they should not stand up here and teach the congregation. This is a, this is a job for the men. So I would say that includes 
You know, so you, you, it's obviously all right to sing. You know, I think it's all right to say amen after we pray. But what I think is not okay is sometimes in churches, men may say something they agree with the sermon. You know, they may put their hand up, ask a question while we're preaching. You know, they may say amen. That's right. I agree with that. I don't think women should do that. Right? Women should be not speaking when that happens. And sometimes you see that. You know, you may be watching, you know, you watch a sermon online and uh, the man's preaching, and then you hear this woman at the back, Amen! So, so women should not be doing that, right? Women should not be, you know, speaking when the teaching is going on, but for men, it is okay. So this is what it's talking about. Now, when it says here, if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. Now, how I understand this is, this is not saying that if you have a question after church is, you know, after because after we are dismissed here, we eat, we do things like that. You want to talk about things, that's fine. I think here the assumption is that women are married, right? Because not every woman has a husband, not every woman has a father that comes to church where they can ask them immediately. But I think this is if something is revealed to them that they think would profit the church, they might ask their husband and then the husband may mention if he's in a teaching position or if he preaches or to mention it to the people that do teach. That's what I think that is referring to. Now, why is it this way? It says it is a shame for women to speak in the church. So I firmly believe, hey, this is how churches should be run today, right? We are given principles in the Bible of how churches should be run, and we ought to stick to it. We're not like the Orthodox Church that just decides like, you know, a thousand years later, you know what? We don't think bishops should get married. You know, that's what they did in the Orthodox Church. They did it in the Catholic Church too. Why aren't priests married? Why aren't bishops married? Because churches somewhere along the line decided, hey, this is not for today. And they said, hey, bishops should not get married. And then this is why you get pedophiles and people molesting all sorts of things, and, you know, because it's good, not good for a man to be alone. So likewise, bishops should get married. This is how leadership works in church too. So women can, you know, sometimes we have a prayer meeting, you break up, people pray. Um, you know, women can sing. You know, I think sometimes women, this is, not, this is not meaning women can't teach any time. You know, so it's different in the house of God. Whereas now, we're at church, women can teach. But let's say, you know, you speak at lectures for your work or you, you do something outside of church. To me, that's fine. But church is run a certain way. So obviously, laughing is fine. You know, like bodily, you know. So don't get this idea that it's like you can't make any noise, you can't laugh, you can't clear your throat that sort of thing. So it's just talking about the teaching. It's about women contributing to this teaching moment here. Okay, let's talk briefly about the office of a bishop. Office of a bishop, Acts 20. What is a bishop? Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. So the bishops are, if you think about it, a spiritual overseer. So they oversee the spiritual aspect of the church, the teaching of the word and also the spiritual guidance of people within the church. 1 Timothy 5, 7, 17, look at this. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. So notice that they are in charge. They rule in the church. Now some churches that have a democratic system, the, the, the bishop doesn't actually rule because the bishop is subject to this board of elders or this board of deacons and they vote him in, they vote him out if they don't like him. But you see here, the, it's, it's the bishops that rule in a church, right? And this is why the elder and bishop, that term is used synonymous, synonymously in Titus 1. So I don't think elders is a separate office, right? Elders are just the older men in church. They are ordained into the ministry. And then there are the elders that rule. Those are the bishops. Be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his, his reward. So you have bishops. Some labor in word and doctrine. Some don't. Right? It's saying the ones that labor in word of doctrine are counted worthy of double honor. So what is this double honor? Is it just more respect? No, it's talking about also providing for them as well. They should get paid more than the bishops that don't labor in uh, doctrine. This is why it says in verse 18, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Now notice that the office, the office, oh, it's not mentioned in here, but the office 
is called a bishop when we saw in 1 Timothy 3. It's the office of a bishop. It is not the office of a pastor. Right? But most people, when they think of the leader in an independent fundamental church, they think pastor is the leader, bishops is a Catholic thing. But no, 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 bishops, Catholics are just using the biblical term, right? But then their bishops are not married, they're not, they're not talking about that, right? Same with the Orthodox. So we ought not to shy away from the word bishop. Bishop just means overseer, right? So the position that I hold is a bishop, but one of the roles that I fulfill is a pastor. So do I pastor this church? I do. But is that my position? I'm a bishop. So I pastor, I do the work of an evangelist, you know, I'm teaching as well, I'm a teacher. But like I said, there are people that can pastor people, but they're not necessarily a bishop. So we don't want to shy away. This is why on the website I say our bishop. Let's say our I'm trying to take this word back. So don't shy away from using the word. You know, let's get used to using biblical words that we have bishop and deacon, not pastor and deacon. Even though it's not technically incorrect, the bishop is a pastor, but like I said, people associate words with things they're familiar with. But, you know, are we, are we going to stop using the word church because the Catholics use it? You know? We're not going to stop using it. We're not going to stop using the word Bible, you know, because we're worried, oh, it's because it associates us with the Catholics. So we, let's make people start to associate the word bishop with biblical fundamentalism, right? So same with our children. If they get used to just hearing, hey, the bishop of the church, the bishop of the church, bishop of the church. If you stop calling me the pastor of the church, you call me the bishop of the church, your children will grow up just thinking that's what it is, the bishop of the church. Just like you think bishop refers to Catholicism because you may have grew up in that system, if we teach the next generation this is what a bishop is, then that'll just be just commonplace for them. So uh, it's the office of a bishop, not the office of a pastor. But the pa pastoring is something the bishop does. Now, the deacon is similar in terms of qualifications but the bit the deacon is more a physical overseer right so they're the servants within the church that have authority but they are just looking after practical matters and we see here in act six the first time people believe that deacons were ordained in the early church and in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied there arose a murmuring of the grecians against the hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration so you can see here, this is hearkening to 1 Timothy 5, where we talk about honouring the widows and taking care of the widows, but to, in order to qualify for that charity, it's not just like anybody gets that charity. You actually had to be a widow that was over 60 years old that met certain criteria, certain qualifications in order to qualify for this charity. Right? So it's kind of like taking these people on into the number where they were provided for and then these widows were also, you know, the assumption is they were a good example to the younger women in church. Well, here you have a, you know, a murmuring here between these two ethnicities because the Grecian widows were being neglected um, by the Hebrew leaders, right? Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve table. So you see here, it wasn't just through to careless neglect, is that there was so much work to do that if they had to do the daily ministration, it was taking away with what they should do, which was the ministry of the word and in prayer. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among yourselves, seven among you, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. See, so am I against necessarily the congregation nominating people and, you know, having a good rapport amongst the people? No. But you see here, even though the congregation may have looked for these seven men, who ordained them? Who had the authority to appoint them over this business? It says, whom we may appoint over this business. The leaders are appointing top down. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And saying, please the whole multitude. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. So we read about him in Acts 8. Uh, sorry, we read about Philip in Acts 8. We read about Stephen in um, Acts 6 or 7 off the top of my head. And Prochorus and Nicanor and Ty Timon and Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased. And the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. So a few things I just want to point out in this passage. 
Like I said, a lot of people believe this is the appointment of the first seven deacons. And it's not specifically mentioned in this passage, but a lot of people believe this is what this is. And but deacons in the Bible are only men because, again, it's a position of authority, right? They are appointed over this business. And notice in this passage the differentiation between the bishops and the deacons because they're going to appoint them over these practical matters to serve tables. And it says here in verse 4, but we will give ourselves, so these are the bishops of the church, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So this is why I think of the bishop as a spiritual overseer and then the deacon, which is under the submission of the bishops, as a, the physical overseers, looking after the physical things. Now in a church, you can see here, once they had people to take away those administrative tasks, right? The serving of the tables. Look at the effect it had on this church. The saying, please the whole multitude, they chose these people. Look at this, verse 7, and the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. This is why it's very important for you guys to help out. You know what I mean? You don't want to get too comfortable in a church where you just come and you just think of yourself as a customer. Right? Just come, what are you going to serve me today? We need to think of ourselves as a family. You need to get involved, you need to help. Right? And the more you help, the more the word of God is going to increase and the more the number of the disciples is going to multiply greatly. And this is why, you know, it's not always comfortable me mentioning the finances and things like that, but I'm trying to drill it into you guys. You need to take this to heart that you want to support the ministry here. You want to get behind it. Ultimately, you want me full time because ultimately you don't want me serving tables. Like you don't want this situation where the bishops are being taken away from the word of God to serve tables. And sometimes that happens in many churches that do not support the bishop, do not get their bishop full time, right? Do not get full time workers in the church, right? They think, oh, you know, they're all fine. They've got enough money and whatnot. You want there to be enough finances in order to pay people to do this job full time. And that way, you don't have bishops that are overburdened, not only with working their own job, but burdened with doing all the administrative tasks in church and taking away from the teaching, taking away from the counselling, taking away from the ministry of the word, and taking away from prayer as well. A lot of people need prayer support as well. So you can see here the effect that it has. And this is the importance of deacons, because when deacons, when a church gets large enough, you assume a church will have the finances to be able to take on a deacon who fulfills those qualifications, and then you have full-time workers that are taking care of things at church. Now, two more things I want to mention. I've got two more points. Number six is adding titles to names. So I'm giving you a few. This is more like a doctrinal sermon today, just giving you some good teaching on about church and, and why, we run, why I run things the way I do. Adding titles to names. This is a quick point. So you might ask, sometimes you'll hear me, people will say, you know, people will say hello to me. They'll say, hello, Pastor Victor. You know, hello, Pastor. And I'll just say, look, you can just call me by my first name. You don't have to call me by pastor. And this is not something I do just because it's a preference of mine. This is something I do because I see in the Bible no command or precedence to call people by that name. And, you know, I know a lot of cultures and a lot of families and whatnot have a practice where they add titles to people's names to show respect. And I don't have any problem with that. You know, you might call uncle so-and-so, Mr. So-and-so. You might say, hey, you know, you shouldn't call people in a different generation by their first name. You know, that's what I was taught growing up, right? You know, you, call, you, know, you don't call fam family by first name. It's Mr. Tay, Mrs. Tay, and whatnot. And I can see how people that may have grown up in that sort of culture see that as respectful. But to me, you know, my culture is not Chinese. My culture is not Australian. My culture is Christian, right? So when I think about what to do, what I want to, the culture I want to bring my children up in, I'm trying to follow the Bible as closely as I can. And you know what? If my children ask me, well, why are you telling me to call him Pastor so and Bishop so and so I mean, in the Bible, they're all being called by their first names. Hey, well, that's a good point. That's a good point that in the Bible, they're all referring to themselves by their first name. Does that change the fact that you should respect people in authority? Does that change how you may treat somebody? No. But how do we refer to one another? Well, in the Bible, we see people referring to each other by their first name. And this is why I say to you guys, I'm fine with you guys calling me Victor. That is my name after all. 
you know. And when people call me like pastor so and so, you know, me personally, I feel it's like a little distant. You know what I mean? Like distant. I don't want to sit up on this ivory tower. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I have authority, but I want to try as best as possible to be one of the brothers and sisters here. But, you know, like I said, do I have a problem? No. But we see in the Bible there's no command or precedence of adding titles before names. So this practice of, you know, pastor so-and-so, bishop so-and-so, Mr. so-and-so, Mrs. so-and-so, uh, I'm not sure exactly where that comes from. I don't know if that's just like English things that are passed down or American stuff that's cut, passed down. But look here in 2 Peter 3. This is Paul, uh, Peter referring to Paul. This is probably the closest that people might use to... to, to uh, you know, support this practice. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Now, is this being used as a title? Is it saying the Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you? Or is it saying even as our beloved brother Paul, also as according to the wisdom given unto you? I, I would say it's the latter. First Peter 5, look at here. Peter is an elder. The elders which are among you I exhort, who also am an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. So Peter's an elder. He refers to himself as an elder, just like say, I, I'm a bishop. Second John. John also is an elder. The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. Now, not only were they elders, they were apostles, right? This is why they didn't have to be bishops, because they were apostles. So you might say we refer to the Apostle Paul, the Apostle John. Uh, as, well, we refer to that because we're saying John the Apostle, Peter the Apostle. But when Paul referred to John and Peter, did he call them Apostle Paul? Like some pastors will insist, or some bishops will insist these days, to be called Pastor so-and-so. You know, some bishops will be like, no, you can't call me Victor. You have to call me Pastor Tay. Is that biblical? Well, in Galatians 2, look at when Paul is referring to them. How does he refer to them? And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. So this is why. You know, is it, is, it's, not just, it's not just me. Like when I say, hey, please refer to me as Victor, it's not just my preference. I, it's actually my conviction to believe, hey, you know, we are called by first names. I think churches, we should be on a first name basis. We are brothers and sisters in Christ after all. Uh, now, do I have a problem with someone wanting to be called by a title? No. If somebody wants to be called by a title, you know, I'm not going to make it a point. You know, I'll just respect that because I believe people should, can be referred to however they want. You know, it's like you go to a sport, and the coach wants to be called coach. If that's what he wants, and he feels like that's the respect he wants, then I'm happy to respect that. I don't have a problem, right, with somebody wanting to be called by a title, if indeed it's appropriate to do so. Um, do I have somebody, do I have a problem? So I have, I have no problem with somebody wanting to be called by a title. I have no problem calling somebody by a title if it's their preference, and it's not, not something that is inappropriate. But I do have a problem with someone claiming that it's a biblical practice. So if somebody says, no, Bible says that we should do that and should do this, that's really what I'm against because I think the Bible is very clear that people are being referred to by their name and, and not with this use of titles. Now the last point I want to talk about, and I'll try and go this one really quick, is we talked about church not being a democracy. So how are bishops ordained. Well, we have verses in the Bible that explain to us how this works. In Titus 1.5, we see here the instruction given to Titus, who was the first bishop in Crete. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. Now, some churches believe that you need multiple bishops, all to agree, in order to ordain another bishop. And I don't believe that. I believe one bishop is enough to have the authority to ordain another bishop. And, you know, I've, I've recently taken on martial arts, like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and the more I think about how martial arts schools are run, the more I just see the similarities between church 
and martial arts, right? Sometimes the way, the way they work. So, and it's interesting as well that the, the spiritual life is likened to a fight, right? So, so we have like, you know, the spiritual fight and then we have physical martial arts. But, but notice in martial arts schools, you have like a black belt who got his black belt from someone else and then he goes and starts his own school, right? And then he is able to give his students black belts. So it's the same, same ideal. Spiritually, you're given authority from one spiritual black belt and then you have the authority to pass on black belts to others that you want to ordain. So you can see here, the pattern here, that Paul had the authority and this is why it's important in the King James Bible. The King James Bible actually uses this term thee and thou and thine. This is not language that is used just to sound cool and fancy and old. You know what I mean? This language is there because it's very specific to note, denote that it's talking about a singular and not a plural. So you know here that he is talking not about the church in Crete. I left you in Crete. He's talking specifically to Titus. I left thee in Crete that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting. So you see how he is specifically talking to Titus and saying, Titus, you alone have the responsibility that I'm giving to you to set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I, singular, had appointed thee. So you see how there's one bishop has the authority to appoint, appoint another bishop. We see this in 2 Timothy 2 as well. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. So we see here in the church a top-down appointing rather than a bottom-up democracy. Right? Because, you know, honestly, democratic voter voting is, is a very foolish system. It's a very foolish system. Now, let me explain why. In Matthew 7, we see here that the majority is often wrong. Matthew 7, verse 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Now you say, Victor, but you live in a democratic country. Don't you appreciate that you have the right to vote and you have the right to affect the political process and change the course of this country? And that's the thing. See, if you want to actually change a system, that's when people like democracy, right? Because then you can change it and try and sway the people in order to change principles and change laws and change politicians. But if you're trying to take a stand, if you don't want things to change, because God's word stays the same, we just need to have judges like bishops in charge, just making sure people are adhering to the word of God, then you don't want a democracy. You don't want it to change. You don't want people to be able to sway the majority and then change the course of a church when the laws are the same, the Bible's staying the same. Why? Because the majority of people are sheep, right? The majority of people are wrong. So we don't want, in a democracy, what is the authority? The authority is the 51%. And this is why there's a problem with democracy, right? Now, we live in a democracy, but you know what? If I had the choice, if I was establishing a country, <laughs> you know what I mean? And I started a country, would I make it a democracy? No! Because I don't want somebody to come in and sway the population, you know, and be like Pauline Hanson in the One Nation Party. She started it as a democracy, and she got voted out of her own party. And then you know what happened? She came back, and you know, I don't know if you know the story, she came back and she said, hey, if I'm going to be the leader of One Nation, I need full control, right? There's going to be one person calling the shots. So in order to take her back, as I think the One Nation, something, supposedly the One Nation Party was like, out of control. They agree to it. So now she has the final say on everything. Now, you know, if Mark Latham takes that over, you know, maybe he'll have the final say after Pauline Hanson has gone away. But, you know, she kind of wised up, you know. So, you know, but, you know, it's not popular, you know, because people want, why? Because people want control over to change things. But that's not how the church works. Church is top down. That's why those in the 51%, they love democracy, right? Because they're in charge. They're, they're rule. They, they oppress the 49%. You want to affect change, 
Democracy grants that opportunity, but from a leadership perspective, if you want to take a stand for God, you don't want it to be able to change. You want to be able to put your stake in the ground. That's why there's a problem with democracy. You know, often the illustration for democracy is gi given. Two wolves and a sheep deciding what's for dinner. You know, my friend in America used to say a really crude example. He'll say, you know, gang rape is democracy in action, right? It's like people, the majority, deciding what to do. And like we see from Matthew 7, the majority is often wrong. So you may say, well, if there are a few in charge and it's not a democracy, what if the leader becomes corrupt? You know, you have that same problem in a democracy. You don't think our leaders are corrupt? <laughs> the people that get voted in, because the corrupt ones are just swaying the majority. But you know what, you have a better chance of one principled man taking a stand, right, and going against the tide than you do than hoping that the majority will stay right. Right, so this is why, yeah, there, there's no perfect system because man is flawed. But there's a reason why God has it that way because one man, like God chose Moses. You see all throughout the Bible, he chose one leader to lead the people to take the stand. Now, did they, they have helpers? Yeah, Moses ordained other judges and whatnot. But God always had one at the top for his body of people. So, I hope you learned something today so, and uh, you learned a bit about leadership. So with that said, you know, please, please pray for me. You know, get behind me. I hope you guys pray for me. You know, I pray for you guys. I hope you guys pray for me. You know, you don't just, you know, hopefully you don't just gripe about me all the time and whatnot. But hopefully you appreciate the things I do. And, but please, you know, we need your prayer. My family needs your prayer. And I hope you guys can get behind me and, you know, we can do great things for God together. All right, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord, for your word. Just thank you for the people here. Uh, I pray that today's sermon was a blessing. I pray that it opened their eyes to a few things in, in your word and uh, how, uh, you know, I believe, Lord, you've led me to lead these things here. So, Lord, I just pray for wisdom. I pray, Lord, that people here will get behind me. And, uh, Lord, I just uh, pray, Lord, that you help us as a church to love one another, to do great things for you. So we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.